You're trying to stir up discontent. And seize the reins of government. And shut our schools and steal the jewels. And even change our football rules. Take away our garden tools. And lock us up in vestibule. Every April 1st, I like to perform feminist analysis on a weird movie of some kind. Just something that's so surreal, no one really makes an effort to understand it, because they just ignore it. A lot of people offered good suggestions for 2015, but Watcher Azazel pointed me to one film so surreal and sexist that I could not ignore it. The lesbian conspiracy, son. A world without men! The Last Man on Planet Earth. Not to be confused with the better Vincent Price film, The Last Man on Earth. Now this one is about a horrifying future where men have all but died out in a plague and women rule the earth. Yeah, because women in power equals a dystopia. There is a little political corruption and the specter of men having died is there, but for the most part, it's all about the shock of seeing women occupy positions of power and being respected like men. It's similar to Catwomen of the Moon and other paranoid anti-feminist and homophobic societies of all women featured in 1950s science fiction. But this film was made in the 90s. The 90s. It came out in 1999, in an era of the Spice Girls, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Xena Warrior Princess, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and the Violence Against Women Act. We were well into third wave feminism when this misogynistic fantasy came out. So who the hell authorized this? Well, it was made for UPN. Ironically, the same television network that would be host to Buffy the Vampire Slayer in 2001. At the time, Star Trek Voyager was playing on the network in the middle of season 5. Though the show was subject to its share of criticism, it was highly regarded by feminists for its portrayal of Captain Janeway and general respect for female characters. The Last Man on Planet Earth is directed by Les Landau and written by Kenneth Biller both worked on Voyager, in episodes appreciated by feminists. For them to work on this sexist piece of crap is quite disappointing. Being charitable, perhaps the film was originally intended to be some kind of feminist satire and it was horribly distorted at some point in production, similar to the film Slumber Party Massacre, which was written, directed, and produced by women with the intention of being a feminist satire of the horror genre, but the studio executives then turned it into a sleazy slasher film. Maybe some UPN executive was a paranoid misogynist who wanted to turn a feminist satire into a serious horror film about women taking over. It certainly was designed by a paranoid misogynist. Because of the title and the fact that several people from Star Trek worked on the film, it may have been intended to be an homage to the 1974 Gene Roddenberry film Planet Earth. In the 1970s, Roddenberry made a trilogy of pilot movies attempting to start a weekly series about a man involved in a cryogenic experiment who then wakes up in the distant future and has to deal with the hostile peoples that populate it. The second film, Planet Earth, deals with the protagonist trying to survive a matriarchal society where women treat men as slaves in an exaggerated BDSM fantasy. Even the summary on the back of the box calls the antagonist a dominatrix. Aside from the fact that Last Man on Planet Earth deals with a matriarchal society in the future, there is no real similarity between the films. While Planet Earth is essentially a BDSM fantasy like the series of gore, except with women as masters and men as slaves, The Last Man on Planet Earth goes for pseudo-realism and surreal horror and comedy in order to make a super meaningful political point. Join me as I explore it. It starts with a terrifying political campaign video that features women. Oh my god! Oh my god, women! There's a female FBI director, Elizabeth Riggs, played by Veronica Cartwright. Yes, that Veronica Cartwright, who is running for senator, and she introduces her family, her wife, and her two daughters. Oh my god, women! The way this is presented, with dramatic music and a sudden cut to the title and pause, gives the impression that this is supposed to be scary. Like having a woman in power, lesbians, and a lack of men in a political campaign video is supposed to be horrifying in and of itself. It feels like it's trying to imply that women rule the world and there are next to no men because men would obviously take center focus in this kind of video. It would obviously be a man in charge of the FBI and running for senator. It would obviously be a heterosexual relationship, and it would obviously have a nuclear family with at least one boy. 
It feels like the film is saying that this is some kind of perversion before nature, when this is actually something that should realistically happen in the future. The glass ceiling needs to be taken out, and women should be respected enough that you could just as easily see this as a Mitt Romney video, and gay couples should receive as much respect as their straight counterparts. This video should be unremarkable. In our current society, it should represent an ideal. That it's treated as horrifying is indicative of the movie's sexist and homophobic nature. Okay, to be charitable, I think the movie is trying for something along the lines of Ellen Season 5, Episode 17, It's a Gay, 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 Gay World, where it tries to show how messed up our society is by presenting a world where homosexuality is the norm and straight people are stigmatized. Oh, dear God. <laughs> is this their idea of art? A painting of a little boy kissing a little girl? That's not art, that's pornography. Is this Norman Rockwell anyway? Some satires will try reversing oppressions to try to get us to care more for the oppressed people because of existing empathy towards the people that society appreciates. I'm straight. It's somewhat problematic on the face of it because we shouldn't need straight people being oppressed like gay people are here to care about gay people here and should be able to just empathize with gay people because they're people. Unfortunately, some people need this kick in the pants, so it does serve a function. Where Ellen succeeds is in that our protagonist Ellen is gay, so we're full of respect for her and can appreciate her standing up for straight people, both on the level of her being the protagonist and our empathizing with straight people. The last man on planet Earth makes the protagonist a straight woman in the closet. You're one of those closet hetero cases, aren't you? And due to the artificial dystopian nature of the lesbian society, it feels more like a message about stopping those evil lesbians slash feminists before they take over the planet and outlaw straight marriages than it is empathizing with lesbians. A vote for Elizabeth Riggs is a vote to preserve our way of life. Okay, she's a conservative. So what? Yeah, it's telegraphed that she's the villain, but there's no real reason to think that based on her family being all female. Her family is also all white, but there's no reason to think that this is a racist dystopia. We just accept that everybody's white because modern American society is racist. And we value some racist idea of bloodline purity so highly that we don't even think about it. To me, that's the real horror of the scene. Modern prejudices are preserved. So the things that are common but bad we don't think about, and the things that are uncommon we are to find horrifying just for being non-normative. After that terrifying video of women in power, we see Washington, D.C. in the not-too-distant future, where the protagonist, Hope Chase, played by Julie Bowen, is trying to masturbate to a hologram of a hunky man. There's an interesting role reversal here where the man is objectified for a female gaze while she acts with a self-assured attitude towards sex that we would typically associate with men. And it's one of the few effective uses of satire in the film. This is, however, hampered by a very male gaze shot that shows her shimmying out of her jeans. I'll note that this hologram has zero intelligence. It's just a projection. So this is just her putting on a show for the men in the audience, which kind of defeats the point. She feels awkward masturbating instead of having sex with an actual man, so she deletes the hologram and goes to work at a university. With women as the only extras. Oh my god, you would never see a movie without women. You know, besides The Thing, Twelve Angry Men, Hell in the Pacific, Reservoir Dogs, Black Hawk Down, Lawrence of Arabia, The Great Escape, both Lord of the Flies films, Saving Private Ryan, Master and Commander, 20,000 Leaks Under the Sea. You know, the kind of stuff no one sees. Hope is a bioengineer working with a professor named Esther, played by L. Scott Cadwell, who played Rose in Lost, one of the few black women in the film. But of course, it's not a racist dystopia. The fact that white people make up 99% of characters is just normal. But put no men in a political video and you just know that something terrible happened. Hope and Esther are working on an experiment to clone men. It's extremely difficult and there's a lot of red tape to work around, so Esther is doubtful of their success. While Hope refuses to give up, Hope tries to get Esther to ignore protocol and develop a subject illegally, counting on good publicity afterwards to save them. But Esther doesn't go for it. So, Hope does as all innovative scientists do in these kinds of fictions. She does illegal experiments on her own. She sneaks in late at night, puts on her Locutus of Borg cosplay, and builds a baby boy. She holds him up and there is full view of his genitalia for the reveal that, yes, she has created man. 
That's really surprising for American TV, which is usually super strict about nudity. I censor it here not because it's indecent, but because I imagine that baby is like 15 now, and he probably finds this whole thing really embarrassing. Sorry, baby actor. Having successfully created the first male baby in decades, she takes him to a cabin in the woods to raise as her own personal project. This reminds me a lot of Rise of the Planet of the Apes. When Will takes baby Caesar home and uses him as an experiment to test an Alzheimer's drug to help his father. In fact, this movie reminds me a lot of the whole Planet of the Apes series, where you have a dystopian version of Earth ruled by something weird that sort of works as satire. It's actually really uncanny how many parallels there are. Two weeks later, baby boy Adam has artificially aged to a toddler, and he's a genius. Hope makes notes documenting his learning ability, similar to Will with Caesar. Unlike Rise of the Planet of the Apes, this is not an important character detail, just a cheap excuse to have Adam be a reasonably educated adult character in a few minutes. Day 17, he's like 12, and he starts asking questions about the war. But Hope puts off telling him and changes the subject. By day 29, he ages into a precocious teenager who speaks hip-hop slang he doesn't understand in one of the movie's many awkward racial moments. Adam, get out of that car now. Yo, Hope, what's the 411? What? Get in! It's the bomb! Why are you learning these expressions? <laughs> Old mini disc. I found him up in the attic. You know, rap. What about the physics problems? Finish. You want to ride or not, bitch? What did you just call me? Later. He calls Hope misogynistic labels bitch and ho, which make me cringe, especially because there's no follow-up to his bad behavior. He's just going through his awkward teenage days. Thank God he's almost through growing. I have no intention of being anyone's mother. When I first saw this, I figured that this would be one of those stories where she has to raise a kid out of obligation and then learns to love him and be his mother. Yeah, that would be the healthy story. Instead, as we'll learn, she was never supposed to be his mother. She's his love interest. Yes, really. She made a boy because she was horny and wanted a husband. Ew. And we're just supposed to accept this as a good, healthy story. No, this story is messed up. Also, nice going taking years off his life just so he can grow a husband. Hope is a sick, twisted individual and she is also our protagonist and we're supposed to love her. Day 32, Hope wakes up to Adam as a nude, hunky man, played by Paul Francis, covering himself and asking for clothes that fit. Because they're actually love interests, the scene is actually supposed to be sexy. We get this beefcake shot of Adam for the female gaze, and Hope gets flustered because she's turned on. This story is messed up. Adam wants to go into the city to see other people, but Hope denies him, similar to Will keeping Caesar in the house. In Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Caesar gets bored, leaves the house, and tries to play with a little girl, only to be attacked by her father, McKay from Stargate Atlantis, who thinks he's a dangerous wild animal. Later on, Caesar sees McKay acting antagonistically towards the confused father, and he emerges to defend his friend, which has the consequence of Caesar being taken away by animal control. In Last Man on Planet Earth, it doesn't go much better for Adam. Just as Hope calls Esther to show her Adam, he steals the car in the middle of the night and drives into the city while listening to rap music. Adam then discovers the horrifying planet of the women. As soon as he parks, a woman jogs by. Oh my god, a woman. And then he sees another woman. Holy goodness gracious. He wanders around and sees women walking around, minding their own business. And then he sees a building bearing the branding United Women's Bank, which startles him. Um, why? Why is that a problem? There's some bank owned by women. So what? Is that truly horrifying? To have women successful in business? Would it be equally startling to have a business owned by men? Like, you know, most businesses in our patriarchal world? It's only really jarring with the grounding in patriarchal gender roles that have men as the business leaders and women as homemakers, which Adam doesn't. And it's only scary if you're a misogynist who thinks that women performing traditionally masculine roles is some kind of inherent threat to men. The name is also strange, more for the viewers living in a patriarchal world than for a verisimilitude, which would treat the matriarchal social structure as normally as we would treat patriarchy. 
and wouldn't specify women's any more than our male-owned businesses would specify men's. Yeah, the only one I can think of is men's warehouse, and that's specifically for a body type. The United Women's Bank is named to be antagonistic to the viewers and create that jarring feeling to communicate the threat that these matriarchal women represent to men like Adam, who acts as the audience's proxy. This is a long way of saying that this is sexist as hell. Adam looks around and is confused and worried by all the women. Oh my god, women! Sure, we know that this is a planet of women only, or at least almost only, but he just sees a bunch of women out of context. How does he know there's a problem? It just treats the presence of women without men in this one section of the city as something horrifying. Which is really sexist. If they portrayed Adam as lonely, looking around for someone who looks like him, that would be one thing. But it's just him being scared by only seeing women. Tense music plays and rapid cuts follow as we see women. Women. Women! He looks up again at the bank and is horrified by the name. It reaches a climax when he turns around and is seen by a mother and her child. It's a man! Oh my god, a man. I think this is supposed to be funny? Maybe? It's weird in any case. It's also very similar to a scene in the original Planet of the Apes film, where Taylor runs away from the apes trying to castrate him, and is seen by a little boy in the ape's place of worship. Look! It's a man! Is this a deliberate homage? Maybe. Or maybe it's just a natural consequence of having a planet of the somethings with a male lead. Oh, you have to this is 8472 to dispatch. I have got a white male. Did you say male? That's right, male. Heading east on ghosts. Here's the male. It never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hope and Esther look for him. The president, I could have been so stupid. I've been asking myself that same question. I have to laugh every time Esther makes fun of Hope. Hope is a terrible character. Hope turns on the radio, hoping for a helpful news report. She gets one calling Adam armed and dangerous. Hope heads for the police chase underway. The whole satire here is about the stereotype of feminists thinking that men are inherently violent, which is blown way out of proportion for what I think is comedic effect, though it mostly comes across as surreal. They put in this tense thriller music that seems more appropriate for the born identity than something this silly. It just has a feeling of beware the women that's really sexist. If this were intended as a comedy, you might expect it to sound like this. cops corner him with their guns drawn. They are completely terrified of him and are prepared to shoot him, while he's not doing anything remotely aggressive. It kind of reminds me of the trailer for Anger Management. I have no idea if the movie's anything like the trailer. I guess it's a satire of the whole Schrodinger's rapist thing, where women don't know if a strange man is good or bad and have to maintain caution at all times. Named after Schrodinger's cat, where you can't tell if the cat is alive or dead until you open the box and observe the cat. But that's a manifestation of overarching problems with American culture associating masculinity with violence, while at the same time putting the onus on women to keep from suffering male violence against women, among other things. It's not just some wacky prejudice like these cops have with Adam. Honestly, this would be more on point if it were about institutional racism. Local police report to the FBI killing at least 400 people a year. From 2006 to 2012, a white police officer killed a black person at least twice a week in this country. The cops mistreat black men all the time because of the intersection between characterizing men as innately violent and characterizing black people as animalistic. Studies have shown that white people tend to envision black people as superhuman, capable of great strength and speed, while feeling minimal pain. Darren Wilson tried to garner sympathy for his murder of Mike Brown through describing him as an inhuman demon. That racism is far more comparable to this wacky anti-male prejudice scene in the movie than the Schrodinger's rapist concept. It also seems relevant to me that many of the organized misogynists who claim to stand for men's rights will flat out deny the existence of institutional racism, referring to demonized feminists instead of trying to help actual men. This seems like their kind of movie. You're trying to kill free enterprise and raise the cost of things and dates and wreck our compound interest rates.